The oceanic region of League of Legends is one of the smallest, yet most passionate regions competing as a wildcard on the international stage. And despite having a long string of good performances for the entire existence of professional League of Legends, Oceania has yet to make it out of a single qualifying or group stage of an international event. There are reasons for this though. So here's a look at some of the unique challenges plaguing the Oceanic region and the history of the teams that fought tooth and nail to prove themselves on the international stage, all while representing the pride and hope of a region. The Oceanic region is comprised mainly of Australia and New Zealand, but also technically including Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and a series of islands and small nations such as Vanuatu, Micronesia, and the Solomon Islands. However, the majority of the players are from Australia and New Zealand. In 2013, Oceania got its own servers. Players could finally play without 180 ping in North America, with an office in Sydney opening around at the same time. There were some problems in Oceania that were quite unique to the region, however. Firstly, location. We all know that Australia is a prison continent in the middle of the ocean, and that significantly impacts the ability of players in the region to gain experience outside of that specific area. A player in Europe could conceivably play on EU West, and with minor increases in ping, play on EU NE as well as potentially Russia, and gain exposure to multiple professional demographics such as Europe and CIS as well as others. Similarly, players in the Southeast Asian region could play on a variety of servers including Garena, Korea, and more recently Japan. The lack of easy interaction with other regions led OCE to becoming a bit of a crucible a region that could get information and influence from the outside while not being able to actually play against the rest of the world and improve the skill of their players. Additionally, with our population spread so far across our very large state, it's much more difficult for players or fans to attend events on the other side of the country. Location is also a problem for the region when considering viewership and support from places outside of OCE, and I'll touch on this later in the video. The second problem? Population. Despite Australia being a country around 80% the size of North America, their population is much less. For example, the approximate population of North America is over 320 million or so. Australia's population is around 26 million. This expands out to just over 38 million when you also include Papua New Guinea and New Zealand. We're also a country of fair dink and bush battlers, so technology take up isn't as high as other regions such as the powerhouse of South Korea that's relatively close by. A population of 50 million people with an area much smaller and compact, connections being much faster and events are easier to get to, and with their extremely early adaptation of esports, OCE just doesn't compare. Lower populations means lower player counts, lower viewership of matches, and potentially less high level players. Even with these challenges in the way, OCE as a region has been proudly sending their best players and teams to compete on the international stage as fans from home raise their koalas and pray the bears are dropped on anyone standing in their way. Despite this though, there has been an ongoing theme of teams from OCE getting their fans hopes up and then choking at the last second, or looking really promising going into an event to then not perform at the level expected. Let's go through the history of OCE at international events leading up to the most recent triumph of Pentanet GG. Our first official foray into the international scene was way back at 2013's International Wildcard Tournament. Team Immunity qualified after a series of open tournaments before winning a LAN event at PAX Australia. Against the competition of Pain Gaming, Gaming Gear EU, Dark Passage, and Lion Gaming, Immunity ended on a score of 2-2, two two, then going on to lose the following best of 3 series 2-0 to Gaming Gear EU. While they technically made it out of the round robin, 4 out of 5 of the competing teams did, and it was more of a formality than anything. Due to the lack of challenge, no change in alleged prizing, and of course this was the founding days of League of Legends before we even started doing things well correctly, the record is barely considered a success for Oceania and has basically just faded into obscurity. Team Immunity went on to rebrand as Chiefs Esports Club, becoming one of the best teams in Oceania and a key feature of this video. Immunity. The Nexus turrets are exposed, they need to get on towards them. The 2014 International Wildcard Tournament saw Legacy compete against Turkey's Dark Passage and the CIS's Russian Force. 
After the first round of the round robin, Legacy was sitting at 2-0 on top of the group and looking promising. After round 2, they did falter a game to Dark Passage. However, DP and Legacy both had 3-1 and went into a best of 5 series at the Gamescom final. Here, Legacy would lose a hard-fought Game 1 to then be completely dismantled in Game 2 and 3, with Nara and Fab Fabulous putting up amazing performances. A very promising start by Cardroid and his boys, but it just wasn't enough. Instantly interrupted, Nexus goes down, and Dark Passage win Game 1 and move a closer step to Worlds. Our next chance would come at the 2015 IWCI, which would eventually be renamed the Mid-Season Invitational. This time we sent Chiefs Esports Club to compete against the majority of the regions. We had Hard Random, Detonation Focus Me, Bangkok Titans, Besticus Esports, INTZ and Chaos Latin Gamers. Day 1, Chiefs won against Chaos and INTZ and lost to Besticus, ending up sitting at 2-1. Day 2, we lost to Hard Random. A win against Detonation Focus Me and a loss against Bangkok Titans had led the team to being 3-3, three and, three. and while this was a decent position, we ended up tied against Besticus in the bracket, seeing as we lost to them on day 1, they were ahead in the head-to-head -head matchups, so we didn't make it into the best of 5 bracket stage. The Bangkok Titans make it 5-1. and one. Later in 2015, Chiefs once again would attempt to qualify for Worlds, with BKT, DP and DFM in our group. Chiefs ended the group on 4-2, sitting at first place in the group, sweeping Bangkok Titans 2-0 and going 1-1 with both Dark Passage and Detonation Focus Me. A five-game series against a team we'd already bested twice this event was all that stood between Chiefs and Worlds. Game 1 was a methodical, fast-paced game, punishing Swiffer and allowing 007X, Bangkok Titans jungler, to run rampant on a deathless 25-minute game. Game 2 was much closer, with Swiffer almost carrying the team to a win, but unfortunately to no avail. Game 3, Swiffer got revenge, and Radio reminded us all that he is a legendary AD carry. And then in Game 4, Chiefs Esports Club lost. G4's Yasuo held half the kills in what was a 20 kill, 40 minute game, and while Swiffer did amazingly to match his pressure, it sadly just wasn't enough. Bangkok Titans, they're gonna be going to Worlds! 2016, Chiefs once again held the hopes of our region, heading into the IWCI. Day 1 set us off on the wrong foot, however, as losses to both Supermassive and Hard Random put us down 0-2. A win against INTZ on day 2 would be welcome, and while we did lose to Saigon Jokers on day 3, we did also beat Lion Game. At this point, we needed 2 wins to clear out of the group, and while Chiefs would beat Isurus later that day, their big challenge came from Detonation Focus Me, who were sitting at 1-4 and four in the bracket at the time. A match we were, on paper, expected to win relatively easily ended up sealing our fate. Chiefs finished at 3 and 4, missing out on the bracket stage. We'll play spoiler today that Chiefs could not execute for the team comp, and Detonation Focus will take a very good looking game. The 2016 IWCQ was the Chiefs' next, and unknown to them, final chance to prove themselves internationally. And on day one, we'd lost to a team we'd never really seen on the international stage Albus Knox Luna. However, Day 2 would also see wins against Chaos Latin Gaming and Saigon Jokers. Sitting at 2-1, we're feeling at least a little better, and ending Day 3 with a win against INTZ makes us look pretty damn good at 3-1. We will then go on to lose every single game over the second week of competition to Lion Gaming, Dark Passage, and Rampage. At 3-4, we lose out yet again. Jeez. One long slow goodbye here. It's now 2017 and after years of dominance, Chiefs are finally dethroned as the representatives of OCE, and we send a new team, the Dire Wolves, to represent us at the MSI Plans. It was the first time almost all of these players had the chance to play on an international stage, but they were hungry to prove themselves. On day one, we entered one and two, losing to Red Canards and Supermassive, finding a win against Rampage. Day two, we won against Red Canards, losing to Supermassive and Rampage. At 2 and 4, we were far from the first place required to move past the group stage, and Supermassive continued on. 
Direwolves were seen as a fresh restart to OCE's potential international success, but unfortunately they only produced more of the same result. World's 2017 International Wildcard Qualifier Direwolves remained dominant and were seeded into Group B against Team 1 from Brazil, who overcame Red Canids and Pain Gaming to represent their region. We also had a little North American team called Cloud9, which you may or may not have heard of. Cloud9 finished 4-0 with only one game going a few seconds over 30 minutes, but with two teams leaving the groups, the focus was on Team 1 versus Direwolves. On day one, Direwolves took down Team 1, with Fantix pulling off an extremely impressive performance on Gorky. Day two, we had a much longer game where Team 1's AD carry Absolute put an impressive 10 kill game on Tristana. Going into the tiebreaker, Direwolves were favoured for being impressively dominant when ahead and still showcasing a lot of strength when behind. However, if you're beginning to see a pattern here, you know how this one ends. Team 1 advances to the play-in stages and OCE goes home. One will find their back-to-back -back victories against the Direwolves! Mid-Season Invitational 2018. Direwolves are sent yet again to represent OCE. Ending day one on two and one, winning against Kaboom and Pentagram got our hopes up yet again, and with only one loss coming from Supermassive. However, yet again, OCE failed to win a single game on their second day of play, with Direwolves losing to Kaboom, Supermassive, and Pentagram. Yet again, race koalas must be lowered. Make it six, but first place already locked. Worlds of 2018. Direwolves were seeded into Group A with Chinese powerhouse EDG and Latin America's Infinity Esports. Day 1, Direwolves managed to beat Infinity Esports, whereas EDG beat both teams in the group as predicted. At 1-1, one one, Direwolves are extremely close to making the plans group stage. However, on Day 2, the craziest result happened. Infinity Esports won against EDG. Direwolves would need to win at least one of their upcoming games to qualify, or at minimum, force a tiebreaker. However, against Infinity Esports, Renyu led an impressive 11 kill game on Kaiser, and the 35 minute game took Direwolves to their limits. They lost to Infinity, and in their follow up game against EDG, the Direwolves only managed to get 2 kills versus EDG's 18. They were stomped in the most convincing of ways, and yet again, were being sent home after raising everyone's hopes. 2019 heralded a new age of Oceanic League of Legends, as the undisputed kings who had held the top three positions time and time again were finally shaken up, and the team representing OCE at MSI in 2019 was the Bombers. A team franchised out by a traditional sporting team, bringing with them a high-class training facility, a sports psychologist coach, and a lot of recognition as a legitimate organization. Day 1 set the Bombers up to a poor start, winning to Isaris, losing to Fenapache, and going 1-1 one one against Fongvu Buffalo. 2-2 was a great start, but they had beaten the Vietnamese squad that was sitting in first place in one of their games. So there was still some potential to see them falter to another team and force a tiebreaker. And part of that did happen, as Phong Vu would lose to Fenerbahce with a final score of 4-2. However, the Bombers held to their namesake and decided to bomb out, losing to Fenerbahce and Viserys. While Phong Vu was taking on Fenerbahce in a tiebreaker, the Bombers were packing their bags and calling an Uber XL to the airport. Worlds 2019 saw yet another team step up to the plate, as Mammoth, a team I actually worked for once upon a time, were placed in Group A with North America's Clutch Gaming and the CIS's Unicorns of Love. Mammoth started the day with a win against Unicorns of Love, later losing to Clutch. However, Unicorns of Love won against Clutch in the first game, so the entire bracket was completely even at 1-1 one one apiece. And on the second day of competition, the results just repeated. Each team was 2-0 to their left and 0-2 to their right, with the group ending in a three-way draw. Due to tiebreak of rules, calculations, and the finest of fine print, etc., Mammoth and Unicorns had to play for the last position in the round two best of five series to qualify for groups. All Mammoth had to do was beat a team once more, a team that they were sitting at a 2-0 record against. 
Now I'm not saying that Mammoth choked, but what I am saying is that they bit off more than they could chew and then took a very, very deep breath in. A 28 minute game ended with only one player having a single kill on the side of Mammoth, and once again, OCE comes up short. The time of asking, they take down Mammoth! During 2020, Legacy Esports managed to win a split, something it hadn't done in several years. However, due to a big sad so sad virus, I'm sure you've heard something about it, the entire event was cancelled. Legacy, however, stayed on top of their game and on top of the entire split, managing to qualify for the world's plan stage later that year. This would be historically one of the strongest showings by the Oceanic OPL. Legacy would be in a group with INTZ, Mad Lions, Supermassive, and Team Liquid, where the first place team is seeded into Worlds automatically, with second place making the final qualifier. The final position for Worlds would go to the winner between second place and the winner of a best of five series between the third and fourth place teams on the other side of the groups. On day one, Legacy took first blood against INTZ, however most of the attention was on LGD, the Chinese squad who lost against PSG Talon. Legacy then lost to Team Liquid relatively predictably, but the attention was directed to LGD losing yet again and now Mad Lions also lost the game against Supermassive. The primary regions were shakier than ever, or perhaps wildcard regions had finally caught up. Legacy then made history, taking down Mad Lions being the first time that an Oceanic team has ever beaten a major region team. INTZ also took a game off of Team Liquid, and Legacy won against Supermassive. Sitting tied at 3-1 for first place, Legacy was in an amazing position. They would either need to win a best of one against Team Liquid, or a best of five against the Group B's third place submission, which would be either LGD, who was looking inconsistent at 1-3, and three, or Latin American's Rainbow 7. Team Liquid took a very convincing 20 minute game and over 10k gold lead to stride directly into the world's group stage, and Legacy still had one last chance. LGD vs Rainbow 7 would determine our final best of 5 opponent. LGD had finally returned to form however, taking game 1 and 2 convincingly, and after a much closer game 3, the team moved on to the qualification round against us. Game 1 was something we're very used to a very slow, controlled choking out of the game as LGD took advantages slowly and just destroyed Legacy on the map. Game 2 was much closer however and it looked like Legacy was more than capable of taking a series against LGD all while rocking a Draven AD carry, something considered rare by some and poorly advised by most others. As the Nexus fell, Legacy was ahead by a kill and only down by around 2000 gold. LGD managed to fight their way back from the brink, and after another 25 minute game, Legacy had been 3 0'd by LGD, missing out on Worlds yet again. Complete the ace as LGD are gonna sweep their way to the world's main event. Days after the OCE had their most promising showing of their lives, an announcement rang out. The OPL was being retired, and the Riot Games Sydney office was being closed. Riot Games invested a lot into the region, however the teams were given warning that they would have to find ways to monetize their brands as funding was limited. On top of that, an entire broadcast studio, including camera talent, technical team members, cameramen, and a number of other production related staff, it just meant that the OPL wasn't financially viable, it was just too expensive to continue. This announcement, like a shot, rang out in the night and a mass exodus of oceanic talent occurred as import rules were relaxed allowing oceanic players onto international rosters while not taking one of their limited allowed import player numbers. The future of the oceanic region was unclear and while we were promised events to send teams to MSI and Worlds, we'd lost a lot. Our identity as the OPL, our funding, our broadcasts and most importantly our structure and the players. After coming so far, OCE was taken out to pasture. Well, that's what we'd originally thought anyway. ESL Australia, with backing from several endemic partners, founded the LCO almost completely overnight. League Championships Oceania. LCO secured talent from the OPL's production, while also providing funding and structure to the teams still around looking to keep the Oceanic Esports dream alive. 
the best performing teams had lost their star players and rosters were thrown into complete chaos. However, one team stood above the rest coming out the other end. Pentanet.gg Pentanet.gg Oh yeah, LCO champions. MSI 2021. Pentanet was seeded into Group A with longtime Oceanic rivals Unicorns of Love, as well as world's finalist Royal Never Give Up. Nobody expected RNG to lose to anyone in the group, so all of the attention lay on UOL versus Pentanet. However, as veteran as the Pentanet squad seemed to be, they were a new org competing internationally for the first time as a group. RNG finished the group without a single loss, so let's focus on the Pentanet and UOL matchup. Pentanet entered day one with three losses, two to RNG and one to UOL. Pentanet did even up their score against Unicorns of Love on day three with a win. Unicorns hit back on day four, however this unlocked something in Pentanet. We noticed their style shift as if the oceanic spirit, if you will, was released. The next game that they played against RNG ended up being an extremely bloody one, with Pentanet taking advantages against the world's contenders, surprising even the analysts. We already know the end result, as RNG didn't lose to anyone, however the Pentanet squad had unlocked their true potential and realized something. It doesn't matter if you're a professional assassin, if you're wrestling a pig in mud, you're playing on their terms. We were the Clown Fiesta region, and perhaps that was something we needed to stay true to. Our reputation as the scrappy underdogs, as well as everything that happened to Riot Games Oceania last year, led to a very interesting situation where we had amazing pocket picks. You see, OCE had been gutted and this random squad showed up to play and none of the serious teams really wanted to scrim against them. So most of their practice was simply playing solo queue, meaning that they were able to play more unorthodox champion picks. Fiddlesticks, Samira, Zed, Vayne, Pentanet weren't adhering to a meta as strictly as the competition was, only playing the top 10 things that they saw in their own scrims. And when Pentanet locked in Zaya for the first time, there was a mix of excitement and fear. Praetith, however, showed us that they were more than capable of performing even with something that's considered an alternative pick. Himself back, but no cause exalt. He's a big problem for the upcoming team know. fight. Decoy goes in with a dredge line onto the enemy support. Anonymous already dead. Praetith going in, looking for another. Lotic's going to be taken down. Double kill over to the Oceanic 80 carry. Victor Alti's looking to do some work, but work will not be done. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in international competition, Oceania will make it past the first round. After years of failing, getting our hopes up and choking to the point where the entire oceanic scene was dismantled for financial reasons, leaving our entire region in chaos, the spirit of Oceania finally came through. You can take apart the region, but you'll never take the heart out of them! Koalas were raised, and with our hopes placed in Pentanet, they made history and helped create a meme as they did so. Just send it. They're up a stage to lose. We're gonna send it. Unicorns of love, we're sending you back to Russia. Uh, look, look, I might know what send it means, but what does the context? We were in the game and I decided to send it. What? Where? At what time? What location? I hate this new language. Can we just. As Pentanet heads to the rest of MSI Rumble stage, they aren't seen as extremely competitive against the best of Korea, China, Europe and such, but this is a team that had done what no other team in Oceania had managed to do thus far. For that, this team needs to be remembered. Decoy and Praetith, the bottom lane duo who showed extreme cohesion and reminded the world that OCE's bottom lane is just hit different. Harboot, with a flare in the hair and a champion pool the size of an ocean, targeting them in the draft became almost impossible. Heard you all were talking sh**. What you gotta say now? Chaz, for being one of the few oceanic representatives to solo kill the mid laner of a world's finalist team with the old solo bolo on the international stage. I don't mean to f***ing love anybody, but I am getting solo bolo. And of course Biopanther, 
steadfast and sturdy, providing reliable frontline for the squad that they so sorely needed. Do it! Do some sit-ups underneath that turret! Also worth mentioning here is Charlie and Udyasov, seen celebrating their team's success at every single point. Bill wholesome, alright? If Pentanet scrubs out for the rest of the tournament, which isn't an exciting thing to think about, even if it's technically pretty possible, it won't matter. For the fans watching at home, a shattered region united, we'd made it. This was it, and I only have two requests for the lads of Pentanet. One, give us these designs, they look really rad, and if you want to be really sweet to your boy, maybe chuck us one for free. But secondly, no matter what Challenger approaches, no matter who you're up against, channel the OCE spirit and just send it.